Megan Kupchak. I'm one of the 10th grade networking chairs. Um, we have an exciting program today. I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Ari Rothman, who is our 10th grade principal, who will be introducing um, two of our guidance counselors, who will be giving us a little sneak peek of what, what's ahead for all of us in the coming years. Buckle up is what I understand, <laughs> right? So go ahead, Mr. Rothman. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad to be exciting. Um, <laughs> Ari Rothman, I'm one of the assistant principals here, the grade level administrator for this grade, and again, started last year. Today, I, you know, it is, is informational, and I only ask, um, as I said at every point, my communication with kids and parents is this is a, a four year journey. Um, you know, be aware, be informed, uh, your school, your kids' school counselors are the best resources available. <coughs> So thank you for showing up. So this is great. So and thank you, Mr. Rothman. Um, I promise you, I do not ask for money. So make that promise to you. So um, so excited to be here today um, to talk to you about understanding the GPA, the academic roadmap, but also how Naviance uh, ties into what's going to be happening uh, the next two and a half years. So it's all exciting stuff that we're getting prepared for. Um, I think what's important for you to know is, and if you take anything away from this, please know that you're not in this alone, right? Because sometimes it does feel scary when you're going through this for the first time. Um, how many of you have already been through this maybe? Okay, so good, good. So maybe I'll call upon you for some good advice for anyone you know, going through this for the first time, but you aren't in this alone. So you have counselors who are very experienced through this process, and I think that it's really important that you utilize us and call us if you have those questions to kind of help that anxiety. Or also, I would encourage you to have your students come in and talk to us if they are feeling that anxiety, all right? Um, it's really sort of the calm before the storm, right? So sophomores should really be sophomores. They should enjoy being high school students at this point, right? And into their junior and senior year. But for you as parents, it's a time for you to start understanding of how their sophomore year connects with junior and senior year, okay? Because things start, will start happening in second semester and they're gonna start having a lot of questions that you may not be able to, to, uh, you know, to answer, but just know that we're here to help. For most students, it's a little early to be thinking about college, so some students are gonna be, that's all they've thought about, right? So Mr. Willett sometimes has a freshman that walks in, it's like, I know exactly what I'm doing, here are my goals, and here's, here's how it's gonna happen, right? And then I have other students that are like, I have no idea, Mr. Willett. I have no idea what I wanna do, and I always say to them, that's okay, right? We have plenty of time to get through this. So we really kinda of have to meet each student where they are. Now, also for you as parents, right? We also get that way. I'm a parent, I have two kids, right? They come home and they say something to me, my anxiety level rises, what, I didn't do this? So it's important to really remember that things will be okay, it's a process, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and you've really gotta trust in this process, okay? All right, so that said, we're gonna go to our first slide here. So sophomore year is really about exploring and goal setting. Okay, it's discovering their personal learning styles and it's creating a path for their future. So we gently introduce to each of the kids goal setting, self-reflection, 
and really who they are independently from their peers. Um, and we also want to connect them to the right colleges, okay? So how many students last year shared their learning styles inventory with you? Raise your hand if you were lucky enough to have that happen, right? So yeah, okay, good. So, so the learning styles inventory, so please do not run home tonight and be upset with your child, okay? And if you have to blame it on somebody, blame it on Mr. Farina, not Mr. Willett, okay? But go home and ask them about this learning styles inventory. And Mrs. Drexel is gonna talk a little bit about that here shortly and what that is. But the reason why I like it is it connects them with how they best learn, right? In fact, we just left the freshman appointments in their health classes and talked about the learning styles. And how does that help? Well, let me just give you an example. So a kinesthetic learner, right? Kinesthetic learners, I'll take you back a little bit, but kinesthetic learners, what do we like to do? We like to take breaks, we like to be very active. If a student knows that or a child knows that, not every teacher is gonna change the way they teach, but they can share that with their teachers. And how I connect that as a counselor is, I say to myself, if you're a kinesthetic learner, when I have meetings with kids, then I say, these are some colleges that might be good for you. So for example, Northeastern in Boston, right? It's a co-op school. Anybody know what a co-op school might be? Yeah, okay, good. So it's a school where really, it's not as traditional. You're learning inside the classroom, but you're also learning outside the classroom, right? And some kids best learn that way. I think we all kind of best learn that way, but some kids are more geared towards that, where other kids are gonna be more geared towards traditional learning. We're gonna be meeting with your kids during class scheduling in early spring, okay? What I do and what the other counselors do is we really sit down with them at that point and say, okay, after our sophomore program, which we're gonna talk about here shortly, um, what did you learn through the whole career interest surveys that you took? How do you compare that with colleges that you're gonna start looking at, okay? And how does this work with junior and senior year when you start picking different classes, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, if you're a kid going into business, right, or you're a kid going into computer sciences, what do you think they should be doing? Looking at our electives, right? We have great introduction to computer science. We have great AP computer science classes, right? Um, and we also have business classes. So I encourage all my kids to really take those types of electives to show the college that this is what you're looking at. And if you're going to apply in business, let's get some of those electives into your uh, transcript so they understand that this is important to you, okay? All right. Oh, there we go. So we spend a lot of time on trying to introduce different topics to you as the parent. Now, you're gonna get a lot of that information through programs like today, um, through our program in May that we're doing. Um, and then your kids are also going to get these types of programs through learning styles, through the sophomore program, through junior uh, year programs and senior year programs. So it's really you and your child coming together saying, hey, here's what I learned, what did you learn, right? So we do that on an on a annual basis. So let me just point out a couple of things. Anybody attend um, the financial aid night that we just had in September, that was a night where we had a presenter come in, talked about how financial aid works uh, at the college level. Um, we had other presenters in the past. We had a brand new one this year, and they talk about things like the FAFSA. Who knows what the FAFSA is? Okay, good. So, right, did you know what the FAFSA was until you got to that point? You did, okay. So, okay, well, that's good. So, because um, I still don't know what it is. So if you can tell me what it is, let, no. So, um, but you know, those are the types of programs. So the financial aid night, if you missed it, we always try to make, like today, uh, for PFA, we always try to record these so you actually, because we know you're busy. So we know you can go watch those on our website. So the financial aid night video is actually on the school counseling website. And I would encourage you, you probably will fall asleep halfway through it, but at least the first 15 or 20 minutes, you'll get some good information out of. It's on the PFA website. Is it on the PFA website? Okay, thank you, so that's great. Um, all right, so in February, um, Summit Educational, 
Anybody heard of Summit Educational here downtown New Canaan? Um, Charlie Hearn, this is not a commercial. Charlie Hearn um, is gonna be here in February to talk about the ACT, the SAT, how to compare those, what is going to be the best for your child. And what I like about Summit Educational is he goes over all of this with you. He's an alumni from our high school, so he knows our high school well. Um, I feel too that he also is going to um, share with you what you should be looking at when you start doing testing. And that's another piece, right? Testing is scary. Every, you're gonna hear out there, test optional, test optional, how great this is, and it is great, right? for certain kids that want to actually not send their test scores. But for kids that do well in the tests, that's always gonna strengthen their file. So that's a discussion you should always have with your counselor on whether you're gonna send those later on or not send those later on. So, so don't walk away today with anxiety over this testing. This is a process too, and we'll talk a little bit about what that, that means. Does everybody know that, um, who took the sophomore PSAT? We have a couple, okay. so. Um, next year, uh, your students will be taking the PSAT in October. Are you all aware that the PSAT and the SAT format has changed? So it has gone to all digital. And you're the first year that that will be happening to. So they'll take the PSAT in October, and then you will end up taking the SAT in March, which is the state initiative and you'll, every student will, uh, must take that in the school system. So that will all be on a digital format and you'll learn a lot about that through, um, through this. Um, the college admissions panel, we usually, we used to do that every other year um, and now I believe we're doing it yearly. Um, anybody attended any of our past admission panels that we've had, couple, okay, um, helpful? So, okay, so um, yeah, so uh, we just had Ann Fleming Brown, in case did anybody attend Ann Fleming, oh, that juniors, I'm sorry, but Ann Fleming Brown from Union was just here this week. Oh, you attended, okay, good. And I'm getting a thumbs up, so great. Um, she is wonderful, and she did an excellent job uh, of presenting to not only parents, but she also presented to our juniors here in the auditorium and did an excellent job with them. Um, but we will have a panel of different colleges. We try to mix the colleges, so we try to have, you know, sometimes suburban, urban, bigger schools, smaller schools, to kind of give you an idea of the differences and kind of what they're looking for through, um, through admissions. And then we also have a parent coffee in May, um, and that will be up here with all of our counselors, all eight of us will be here, and we will be presenting at the end of this year a much more in-depth discussion on how everything's going to be kicked off, how everything's gonna start happening for you in junior and senior year. So where I'm going with this is that we really try to introduce all of this to you. We can't get everything out there, but what I always say is your counselor's that person where if you're just feeling uncomfortable about something, or you think you've missed something maybe, or you just don't know, reach out to us and we will help you with any of those questions. All right, so today um, we're gonna start with the graduation requirements and the GPA. I know the GPA is like very interesting stuff here. I know you're all waiting on that. So, but before we get to that, I'm gonna have Mrs. Drexel um, start with the uh, graduation requirements. Okay, so graduation requirements. Uh, what I would want to first start by highlighting is that the graduation requirements and the four-year plan for your student is a collaborative effort. So the student is, of course, a part of that process, parents overseeing that process, and then the student school counselor. So this is a breakdown of the credits. Um, we would uh, like to highlight that the credits, um, so a full-year class, is one credit, half your class is 0.5 credits, and this is the breakdown. So students will take four years of English, they'll take three years of social studies, uh, part of social studies requirements is a civics requirement and a US history requirement, and then we do have a VPA, a visual and performing arts, which is 0.5, and a career um, technology credit, which is also 0.5. So sometimes, you know, your ninth grader may have taken both of those in their ninth grade year. Some took their VPA last year and are now focused on their CTE. 
And then in addition to those cre credits that I highlighted, we have humanities credits and STEM credits. So an example of a humanities credit and how you fill those boxes, boxes or how your student would fill those boxes is we, you know, we require the three um, credits in social studies. Typically, a student may take four years of social studies or three and a half. So that 0.5 or that one credit would go into the humanities. World language is a graduation requirement. One year is required. What we like to highlight with these credits is that these are minimum um, credits. So keep in mind that these are the minimum requirements. As we look towards college and beyond, students will likely be taking more than the required courses. Okay? Can I just mention yeah. um, also, this stressful is absolutely correct. Your kid is going to try to convince you that I only have to take <sighs> two years in world language, right? Don't let them do that to you, okay? <laughs> Because these are state requirements, we want them to meet college requirements, right? So we want them going above and beyond. Now that does not mean that they uh, can take three world languages and not do that their senior year. That's a possibility. But I, as the counselor, would say to them, okay, if you're going to do that, let's replace that with something that's just as rigorous as that language course, you know? And it, does, it is different for every kid. You know, there are surprises. I had a kid come in one year and wanted to do only computer sciences, uh, junior and senior year. I said, that's not a good idea. Colleges definitely want to see biology and chemistry, right? Those are two that they must see. And she said, Mr. Love, what do you think? She's she very defiant. She said, no, I don't want to do that. So we, what I did, called her parents in, and had this nice discussion. Parents said, we support her. This is what she wants to do. So she focused on even computer sciences her junior senior year with only two years of a science. And she got into her field of study for AP computer science. So she did well. So there are always going to be these different back and forths. And we're not, we're experts at what we do, but we don't know everything, right? We just always try to be very conservative. But that's a discussion that will happen with your counselor if your child comes home and says, I don't want to do this. Always double check with the counselor and make sure that, that that's a problem. Yes. yes. So, again, so again, we're really, really looking, looking for that, that three to four, four years. years. Um, I recently attended a big um, the, uh, webinar with the Big Ten colleges and universities. And um, something that was highlighted that I was not aware of is that um, world language, taking three to four years of world language, um, they actually report that students do better academically once they're in college. Um, so it helps with enhanced problem solving skills, improved verbal and spatial abilities, improved memory function, and enhanced creative thinking capacity. Something to keep in mind. Okay, this is an example of an academic roadmap. Have um, parents seen this before? This is something that's completed in the student's uh, freshman year. So we're actually in the process of meeting with our current freshmen right now and creating this academic roadmap. So something to um, highlight, it, you know, it's fluid, right? So I met with a ninth grader yesterday who thinks that they, you know, are really enjoying social studies. So we went in and we're planning junior year, senior year, you know, maybe considering some AP classes. Again, that may change depending on um, the student and if their interests change. Um, so that's, this is just a sample of that. So as Mrs. Drexel said, the academic roadmap is very important. So we shared that. We sent that home to all of you last year as freshmen. Um, we also emailed that as a Google Doc to your child, okay? So, you know, make sure that you have that because that's kind of um, a partnership that we have, right? For them to understand this is what you can do and this is what you should do, and that does change over time, so they're able to change their own kind of acad academic roadmap as to whatever those recommendations are. Um, Mr. Will has never had a student not graduate, okay, and I'm Mrs. Drexel, I know you're brand new, I, but, I have not either. okay, and so <laughs> that is our hope, right? Um, and you won't, so, but that is our hope, but this is a partnership, right? They, um, you're the second year, if you remember right, some of you may have older um, kids who only had to graduate with 23 credits, and the state changed that recently to 25 credits. So we work together to make sure that we're meeting those goals um, of credits and the distribution of, um, of those credits. 
Okay, so the grade point average, the GPA. So let's talk a little bit about the GPA. So you'll see up here uh, on our screen that we have four different GPAs. Um, I don't know why we have four, but we have, we have four, four, right? It was approved by the Board of Ed, um, but it is a little confusing as to what's included in those GPAs. So it's just kind of like a war. You may already know this, but if you don't, um, then this will be good information for you to have. Um, so we have the comprehensive GPA. We have the weighted comprehensive GPA, the academic GPA, and then the weighted academic. So when you look at the first line, which is the comprehensive, that's going to be everything that your child has taken, right? It's all dropped into that GPA, except for PE and health, where they only receive credit and does not affect their GPA. So everything's under that line. Then you look at the weighted comprehensive GPA. That's going to be everything plus any AP or honors. Now, the AP and honor classes are a multiplier of 1.075. But remember, you're not getting 1.075 for every class that you took. You're only getting that for the honors and for the AP. However, the weighted comprehensive GPA, that would be um, APs or honors that fall within the electives. So that might look like uh, AP music theory, AP computer science, those types of electives are going to fall within that line. Then you have the academic GPA. The academic and the weighted GPA are your five core academics, right? So that's your English, your math, your science, your social studies, and your world language, okay? So the weighted, again, is going to be only for those five core academics, okay? So it may be honors algebra 2 M4. It may be AP statistics. That's what's going to fall um, there, okay? The other thing to keep in mind when colleges look at your GPA, we report your weighted GPA. That's what we report under our school profile, okay? So when counselors are sending information over to the colleges, that's typically what we're reporting to them. However, Colleges, even though that's what we have reported, colleges are going to see all the GPAs, okay? Every college is a little bit different in how they calculate GPAs. So for instance, they may, some colleges may look at that academic GPA and they may add their own weighting to this GPA. And to give you an example, they have so many different high schools from all over the United States right, the kids that are applying, they have to uh, have a level playing field. So some high schools may not have AP classes. Some schools may not have ECE classes. So they have to have some way, and they sometimes will um, give their own weighting to that academic GPA, okay? The other piece for our kids is that they always come in, what's my uh, GPA on a 4.0 scale, right? Are you getting those questions at home sometimes? So I always use, and I think all of us use, the College Board Converter, right? So if you Google the College Board Converter, GPA, that's the one that is typically used throughout you know, all of the colleges. Um, and that'll give them what their GPA is on a 4.0. Everybody understands we're on a 100-point scale, but there's a lot of high schools that are on that 4.0 scale, okay? Now let's just, I just put an example in here. So this is a, a junior, uh, comprehensive GPA 89.62, raised a little bit, right, with a 92.72, so that indicates to me that kid didn't have a lot of honors, but had some honors, right, uh, as an elective. They have had one AP, and then we have the academic GPA, which was an 89.03, and then their leading was that 92.55. Now, you have probably not seen a transcript yet, or if you have, up, and I don't think you can see it real well, but up on the right there's a box. And after four semesters, we then start to weight their GPA. Okay, so none of you will see that at this at this point because you are only seeing your last year's GPA, which is the top left right there. Okay? So once they've done the end of this year and they go into junior year, you will start seeing all four of these GPAs show up on their transcript. 
Now, I want to mention, I have students call me all the time, especially sophomore students, and they say, Mr. Willow, I'm doing a program at Columbia in the summertime, and they want to know what, what my weighted GPA is. We can always give you that information. So call your counselor, and we can calculate that weighted GPA, <coughs> give that to you so you can provide that to the college that, um, you know, that you're looking at for summer schools and, and different things like that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is, as we've got this transcript up, is that colleges are going to look at the yearly GPA. So you see this is an 87. I think this says 88. I can't really read it. And then the junior year is an 87. So that, as the counselor, that indicates to me that, OK, there's not really too much going on here, right? The kid's doing well, not fluctuating with the GPA. But if we looked at this GPA, or I looked at it, which I will, typically at the junior parent meeting, and I say that's an 87, went down to an 82, and then went down to a 70, what do you think's going on there, right? That's where your counselor's going to come into play and try to figure out how we're going to portray this to the college. And that could be a lot of different reasons. Sometimes you have kids' GPA go down because they've taken a lot more AP classes. They've done a lot more honors classes, and that's perfectly fine, right? That does happen, but we have to make sure that we balance that so that doesn't happen too much. And there's always other scenarios, and that's our job really to kind of uh, talk to the colleges about what that, uh, what that might be. Mr. Rothman, you have a question? Yeah. Um, a comment? I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the school counselor throughout the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year is checking in with the student in the course selection process, weighing advantages and disadvantages of taking classes that might be accelerated in light of the whole thing. Is that true? It is true, yes, very true. So we try to uh, check in with the kids. Um, I have to say sophomores, we try to get the sophomores in. I don't know what it is, but the sophomores, it's just you know, the type of year where they don't come in as much, and then all of a sudden they're in our office all the time, junior and senior year. So do encourage your kids to come in and talk with us if they're nervous about something or nervous about a grade. But we do uh, check progress reports. We go through all their grades. We will call them in if we see uh, they went in. Like, let's just give an example. If And this happened this year. I had many kids that decided to take AP chemistry as a sophomore. Okay, typically you should either only take chemistry or honors chemistry before you ever make that jump from biology to AP chemistry. They came in, I noticed that their grades were not where they should be, and we talked about that as a family, and we moved them to honors chemistry and they did much better, right? And there's a huge difference between those leaps. So you have to remember that when you're looking at APs, right, you have to remember that APs are 30 35% more work in regular classes. And I had a student come in one year. I hope you like these stories. I, I mean, this is okay. But, you know, I had a kid that wanted to take six APs as a junior. Um, and I knew that this was going to be very difficult um, for her and talked it out with her to say, let's try to, to step back for a second and think about this is what's going to happen to you with this class. And she decided not to do that. She ended up doing five, did great. But sometimes it could be just that one extra class that just totally throws them for a loop. I'll give you an example. Anybody ever taken AP US history? Right? I mean, there's a lot of writing in that. Oh, yeah, you, you would have taken it, right? You used to teach AP US history. So, so you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Hoffman, right? Um, um, so, so anyway, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what the transcript will look like. Um, so you don't need to run out today and, you know, Call your counselor and try to figure out what the way the GPA is. But this will give you an idea of you know where we're coming from uh, with the GPA here. Okay, so yeah. But I have to say, I have been counseling for the last two years, and I have to say we had one GPA on the 4.0 scale. So the learning curve certainly was the four on the 100 point scale. So just keep in mind that we are a resource to help explain and understand that. I think some t students really track that quarter GPA that they're seeing in power school. So sometimes junior year when we're showing the transcript for the first time, it can be a surprise. So um, just something to keep in mind that we're here. So in keeping with the discussion of honors and AP classes, you know, sophomore year is, um, I really like the sophomore year. I think it's a great year for self-exploration of the student, self-reflection. 
they've transitioned to high school, they're getting to know themselves a bit more as learners, and so really looking ahead to junior and senior year, it's identifying the classes that either they're going to continue on the honors track, or add in honors, or look at our AP offerings. So we're part of that process, so the school counselor will meet with every student as they consider their classes for their junior year, and again, as they do it for their senior year. Teacher recommendations. So I have to say, in um, my experience so far, and I know it's um, short experience, um, however, teachers take their recommendations very seriously. They do know the students as a learner in their classroom and their strengths, and then their continued areas for growth. And they also know the curriculum and the content that's going to be taught in future classes. So those teacher recommendations are really important, and we do stress that families um, you know, consider them. Certainly there are situations or circumstances where um, you know, there might be um, you know, a disagreement about the recommendation, and that, again, is where your counselor can be helpful in explaining the appeals process and all of that. So um, I have learned very quickly here at New Canaan, we have very talented students, um, tremendous aptitude, bright, articulate students who you know, may be recommended for multiple honors and AP classes. And that's where the conversation, hopefully at home and also with your counselor, will be around rigor versus balance. So just because a student can take four AP classes, can they take them all at the same time? So those are conversations that we will have and encourage you to have as well. Um, you know your student, you know their life outside of here, you know how heavily involved they may be with athletics or music or theater, and all of that is a part of the decision as you're looking at the junior and senior year. When we talk to college admissions representatives about what's important that they're seeing on a student's transcript, it's the growth from year to year. Um, and that does look differently for um, different students. So just keep that in mind. Okay, we also like to highlight um, during this meeting that we have ECE classes. So ECE classes are early college experience classes. We partner here with the University of Connecticut. They are classes that are offered here um, by our teachers who have gone through um, a training program with UConn. Mr. Willett happens to be uh, one of the counselors who oversees our ECE um, classes and offerings. Every year we're looking to add more, um, so there's a lot of opportunities out there with different classes. So this is something you may see in the program of studies um, and something to consider. It gives the student an opportunity to earn college credit not just at UConn. Um, actually, the ECE website is wonderful in that it allows you to type in a school or college that your student may be considering and tell you how the AP, ECE, AP statistics course may be accepted at that college. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, one aspect about ECE that I like um, is that it doesn't come down to one test. So AP classes um, and credit that's awarded for AP classes is um, really dependent on how the student does on the AP exam that they take here um, in May. So that's just something to be aware of. We also have a partnership, and I would say uh, absolutely an underutilized opportunity with Norwalk Community College, where if a student has a B average, um, they are encouraged to apply to NCC. Um, there's an array of offerings. Typically, it's like your entry level college classes that students could take at Norwalk Community College. So again, getting that college class um, feel at, um, at, the, at a local school. Um, so I spoke a lot about ECE, AP, higher level classes. Um, you know, as your student is looking ahead towards junior year, and I met with a ninth grader yesterday who comes to mind. You know, some students don't have the confidence in that maybe they've been a solid A student in the regular classes, and they aren't sh so sure if they want to take that leap to honors classes, and they feel they may struggle a little bit. We certainly you know, want to make sure that students are balanced and feel supported and feel like they can manage their courses. 
and also high school is an opportunity for them to be a bit uncomfortable with some of their academics and maybe um, grow from those experiences. So there's a, I don't know if you've ever heard of Harlan Cohen, it's a wonderful, he's a wonderful speaker. He talks about this idea of um, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. So if your student is somebody who, you know, maybe is a little hesitant to take that honors class, um, that's something that the counselor can also talk to you about if it's an appropriate fit and if we should push your child to do so. Uh, Mr. Jackson, yeah. I was going to mention yeah. um, with ECE, um, I am the coordinator here for, um, for UConn with that. I honestly think that ECE classes are excellent. Well, the reason why I like them is that if you end up taking AP statistics, let's say, then you can also get credit for the EC program. I find, okay, this is my experience, I find that credits transfer so much better than AP credits. Because not all colleges are going to accept AP credits, but I guarantee you 98% of the colleges will accept that EC credit for your child. So if they have that option, they should, you know, they can take AP, but always get that EC credit. Some will just say, I want to do AP, I don't want to do the EC. I always try to encourage them, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing EC. You get the credit. You don't have to take any test. You get it if you get if you pass the course. So, you know, if your child is taking an ECE course, just encourage them to try to go for that credit. When shall they can uh, join the ECE course? Uh, I mean, when can they start to apply something? Yeah, junior and senior year. Um, we sit down with them. Um, I think there's there's also, um, we're adding some for next year. So I think one that comes to mind that we just got approved is cultural anthropology. Um, that's one that we're going to be um, including next year. So typically junior and senior year. So we'll talk about that with uh, them during class schedule. And, and just, just a, a final, final note, note about, about honors and AP classes. So. Um, it's important that the student is able to identify um, that the readiness piece to all of that, right? So are they somebody who is consistently coming to class prepared? Um, do they have self-initiation, self-advocacy skills? Do they have curiosity about the subject? So hopefully a theme that you'll hear when we start talking about Naviance is there's a lot of assessments available for students to understand their interests and how it connects to classes that they may want to take. And maybe those are the areas where the student's considering the honors class. Okay, starting the college search. When to start? Um, we really want to stress today that students need to be developmentally ready for this. I also like to tell families that the post high school planning process starts once, you know, the students with us at the high, in, in high school, right? So it's the academics, um, their academic planning that they're doing, it's the classes that they're taking, it's the grades that they're earning, it's the skills that they're learning by, you know, going to see that teacher during RAM time for extra help. So for me, the college search process and the college planning process really does begin um, at the start of ninth grade. I think how we talk to students about the college process and when we start to have those conversations will really be an individual decision for each student. Um, some students are ready, as Mr. Willett said, you know, sometimes we have ninth graders who, you know, their first meeting with us is, you know, where am I going in four years? And that might be great for that student. And then we also have students who they don't know and it can be very overwhelming for them. We do like to bring this up at this presentation because spring does, you know, have the opportunity for the visit to the college campus and the university and, and starting to see April's a great time, April break's a great time if you did want to, you know, bring your child um, because college session is still, you know, the students are all there so they get to kind of see like who's on campus. Um, and summer also just allows, there's, you know, our students are so busy with sports and you know whatever it may be, extracurriculars. So summer is also a great opportunity. So we do like to bring this up, um, but we want the student to be ready. And I just want to mention yeah. too, what, you know, everybody is at different places. I understand that some people do feel that it's too early to let the kids just be you know sophomores enjoy high school. But I also look at the other side of things. I don't want any of my students surprised at the end of sophomore year when they start researching colleges in their junior year that 
I'm not leading where this GPA is to get accepted. So I always feel that we start now, right, and we let them know this is how important, you know, in a, in a healthy way, um, this is how important your GPA is. If this is what your goals are, if these are the schools you're looking at, you want to make sure that you're working hard and when you go and make those choices for your classes next year, or you want to get into, you know, let's say a kid, you know, wants to do one AP, right, as a, as a junior, I want to help that kid and kind of help connect them as this is what's going to be helpful to you through that college process. So I feel like it's never too early to start because time, as we all know, goes very quickly and before we know it, they're going to be sitting in my office as seniors and finding colleges. So I think this is a good time for them to really understand all of this. Okay, Naviance. How many people here have seen and been on Naviance with your child? Okay, that might be potentially a homework assignment <laughs> that we can give you is asking your child to you know, show you Naviance. So we actually, students log into Naviance through their class link, it's single sign on, which is great because it's their email, they just click and they're there, there's no, you know, I forgot password, any of that. Um, so you would have to log in with your child. Um, right now, um, if they were a freshman here last year, they'll have their learning styles inventory survey results available for you to see. Um, so that could be something that you explore. Um, I am a huge advocate of Naviance and I'm a huge advocate of utilizing it over the, over the four years that they're here. So certainly our seniors are the ones who are you know, on there, especially in the early fall on a daily basis where you know, we work with them, we process applications through our side of Naviance. So that's definitely where it probably is the most used junior year as well. Um, Mr. Willett will go into this more, but as they're starting to plan and consider different colleges. That being said, for sophomores, there's a lot of assessment tools. There's also a lot of resources that we don't necessarily use with the student, but they have access to. Things like a resume where they can start to format and list their activities and Naviance actually creates you know, a, a downloadable PDF resume for them. Um, and then there's also an opportunity where they can goal set through Naviance. So just something to take a look at, um, great resources there. Um, it's a college and career readiness tool that helps students identify strengths and interests and connect them to post-secondary goals. Yes, so the, um, the only people that have access to you know, what the student's doing on their Naviance account is the counselor does have access, so we do see, um, and then the student has access. And if the student chooses to share with you their, um, their login, you then would, would see it. That, that's a great question though, that comes up a lot. And I think it's uh, rightfully so, you know, we, we wouldn't want the college seeing all of that. So it is absolutely private. So there's nothing for you to worry about. Naviance is only used um, through us through sending re recommendations, that type of stuff. But any of those assessments, none of the colleges will ever see any of that. Okay. okay. So, so um, the, the road, road to graduation, graduation and beyond. So just a look at what we do in the ninth grade year. So we've been mentioning the freshman learning styles. Um, this is um, when you, if you log in or have an opportunity to log in, the assessment is the Achieve Works Learning and Productivity. This is the, um, the top part of the summary that you'll see. So um, this student is, I don't know if you can see it up there, but they, um, they came back as a high auditory learner. And then it helps them understand their sensory preferences environmental preferences and mindset preferences. Something that we've highlighted with our freshmen is, you know, you're not necessarily going to change the classroom environment or the teacher's, you know, style. Hopefully the teacher is taking into consideration that every learner in front of them may have a different learning style and, and trying to do, you know, a combination of lectures and hands-on activities. Um, but what we highlight to students is they are in control of their learning environment. So if there's somebody who, you know, really needs a, um, a structured surface, you know, area where they're studying and not in their bedroom, on their bed, where they may, you know, get 
sleepy or you know tired or whatever, then they need to know to you know sit down at the kitchen table. Um, so these are conversations that we've had with them about that. Some students think that they learn best by listening to music. It's always interesting when the results come back because you know studies show that that's not always the best um, option for students. You're not taking in as much information as you think you may be. So sometimes it's nice when a survey can tell them that and it's not coming from parents <laughs> um, or even us. So this is the learning styles inventory. Um, I really like it. We can reset it. So if your student was, if you know, brings it to your attention that they took it last year and they're like, yeah, I just wanted to get it done. I went through it very quickly. Um, we can reset it. I have to say the freshmen this year were like very into it, most of the groups. Okay, sophomores. So um, sophomore year is we are going to be doing the career cluster finder. This will help students identify their interests and dis discover career clusters that contain careers that might interest them. This will be completed in January through the health classes. Um, what I like about the career cluster is it doesn't, um, you know, it, it's not super specific. It's more of like an overarching theme of a career pathway that they may want to consider. It also will help students think about um, their electives um, classes that they may want to take and also areas where they may want to focus on the honors or the advanced level classes. Um, so that will happen in January um, with the sophomores through their health classes. This is an example of what they see, will see um, at the end and again everything saves. There's a wealth of information here so they actually can explore that career path, how many years of education they need, if they were to go to Minnesota and live their life in that profession, how much money, um, you know, may they make, and they like that part. Uh -huh. So there's just a lot of different information here. Other useful tools, again, that we don't necessarily administer directly with students, but um, we find really helpful is there's the Career Interest Profiler. If anybody's ever heard of the Holland Code before, um, it's all about how you should find a career that fits your interests and basically you know you are going to enjoy going to work more if you're in a career where it, it's aligned to your interests and then there's something called um, achieve works personality if you have older students they may have done years ago um, they may have done the do what you are um, it's based on myers-briggs which um, i know i had to do in college so it really helps students understand, um, again, their personality, their interests, and how that ties to their potential college major and career path. And if I could just add, anybody taking the Myers-Briggs? Okay. So, so we know that the Myers-Briggs is a very costly assessment. You know, it could cost you anywhere from five to seven thousand dollars outside of the school. This is one of the assessments among the others that's absolutely free. It's the mini Myers-Briggs, so it's not as much information, but it's there. And so sometimes I think it's important as parents to know that these are some really good tools. And the other part of this I like is this shows them some of these assessments with their personality, how it connects to maybe a field of study. And what it does is it kind of gives them sometimes some ideas of, oh, I didn't even know that that might be something that works with my personality. You know, and that's really what I like about the assessments. When they start reading through them, they're like, wow, I never even thought about this field. You know, and we all know you're going to spend what? 40, how many, Mr. Ruffin? Uh, 40, you know, 45 years, right, in what we do. You know, that's different, right? I've been at this for 73. <laughs> so I knew it was up. No, I'm just kidding. But we don't know, right? And most kids do nowadays. It's not like when I was, you know, I'm, I'm older, so you stay where you're at for a long period of time. But kids typically move now. But it's just a nice thing to kind of understand where they're at. Yeah. And, just and just one, one final, final thing, thing to add, add students, students who um, may be looking for part-time work, this could maybe guide, you know, where do you start? I mean, some of that's where there's job opportunities, right? But this helps in, um, also with interview uh, interviews as well because um, one of the surveys is the blind spots. Which one's that, Mr. Rilla? Is that the career interest profiler? 
yes. Okay. okay. So the career interest profiler will um, help students see not only their strengths, but they, they what they refer to as blind spots. So sometimes when students are asked to interview and they have to identify what you know, what are you good at? What works for you? Where may you need support? I find that students really need language around that, and this gives a great summary on some of that language. Again, this is just images from the Naviance page. Okay, and then finally with um, Naviance, and um, we have Road, Chi Road Trip Nation. I don't know if anybody has ever seen Road Trip Nation on PBS, um, but it, it's there and it exists, and it's longer segments. And basically what it is is it follows people doing what they love. So it follows very successful um, people in leadership-type roles who have found their career that they love. Um, what Naviance has done is it has uploaded, I think there's like 3,500 um, Oh, 8,700 videos um, that, uh, that have been posted that students can explore. Um, sometimes students are like, oh, I like math, I like science, I have no idea what I'd want to do with that. So this is, again, another useful um, archive for them to go to. And the students appreciate it because they're, they're shorter videos. We're not, you know, they're, not, they're not super long. Um, and they are, they're, they're pretty engaging. Would you agree, Mr. Willett? And, and they talk a lot about, in those videos, I've watched several of them, they talk about how they got to where they are. And what I like most is they talk about uh, being a sophomore, some of them in high school, and then they wish they had done this. And so that's what I really enjoy is it gives the kids some ideas to think about while they're still in this and not regret it later on. Uh, so, so I just I took you through that. freshman year. Sophomore year, Mr. Willett's going to now take you to junior and senior year. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so as a junior, um, we're really going into the research stage of things, right? So we're going to get into that this year. So for instance, Sarah and I are in charge of the sophomore program this year. So in January, in your kids' health classes, we are going to be going over um, the assessments. And then we're gonna be meeting with them again in April, and that's going to connect their assessments to colleges that fit with their um, assessment style, whatever that may be. So they're gonna have a good idea by the time they leave this year of some different colleges. And I'm gonna kinda show you or go through the process of what they're gonna be seeing next year um, in Naviance and as a senior, okay? So, let's talk a little bit about what you'll see and what they're gonna see. So, I put a, can you see the arrow? I made sure it was like the biggest arrow. Um, colleges I'm thinking about in Naviance, and that is important because this is where they can go. And I tell my students and the other counselors tell their students, I don't care how many colleges you put on your list at this point, you could put 50 on there, and they do. But this is important to put it in there because you're gonna start working with your counselor as a junior over time, beginning junior year, towards the end of junior year, of whittling down that list of what's right for you as a student. So the colleges I'm thinking about, once, once they, they add schools in there, it looks just like this. So this student has Auburn, Connecticut College, UConn, and Georgetown University. And this also is going to give them a lot of information about how this college accepts applications, right? So we won't get into too depth in this, but you see these little kind of icons here. You see these little computers that say CA, okay? That's the common application. That's how this college accepts. You see the little stamp here, and that's Georgetown. Georgetown literally is probably the only college that accepts nothing digital, okay? Um, I think it might be the president. Don't tell him I said that. But he, uh, he just wants everything physical. I mean, that's okay, right? But it's harder on us. So. This also will give them 
their deadlines, their application deadlines. What are they doing, okay? Are they doing early action? Are they doing early decisions? And these are all terms I'm using with you right now that are probably scaring you to death, right? But this will come in time to figure out what's right for them. I have kids that come in all the time and they say, Mr. Willett, I'm gonna apply all early action. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to apply early action to these schools. You're gonna apply regular decision to these schools. Anybody have an idea of why I might say that to a student? So all good points. Yes, all, all good points. So I, I would agree with, you know, and we also have knowledge, for instance, UConn has free debt, right, that you can apply to UConn and not pay any of uh, the registration fees. And I get it. It's only $75, but when you times that by however many, you know, you're applying to, it's a lot of money. The kids always say to me, oh, it's not a problem, Mr. Willett, right? <laughs> they use the parents on this. <laughs> Oh, um, she was just saying that, you know, you might want to stagger these because of cost, um, different items like that. My personal belief is that I think it's more important is that colleges are going to only see up until the end of your junior year, right, the grades. So if you're not meeting that GPA or you're close to that GPA, I would prefer as a counselor to show that you have a, a strong first quarter, right? And that's what we're doing right now is we're sending first quarter grades and if you're applying a regular decision, then I want them to see that you've done much better from that last year, uh, second semester GPA to your first quarter kids. You know? So there's a lot of moving parts to this. Um, kids also come in to me and say, well, I'm going to ED. Everybody know what an ED is? Early decision, you sign a contract, you must go if you're accepted. Um, sometimes students say, well, that shows that I'm you know, really interested in where I'll go, right? And I'm like, okay, yes, but you have to have the GPA or you have to be close to what their accepted averages are before you'd ever use an ED on something like that. So I'm getting ahead of myself there, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea that right now, they should be using this. By the time the end of this year, I will see colleges in there. And then we're also going to be um, into junior year, we're going to be sitting down with you as a family. You all of you know that, probably some of you do. And we actually will sit down as a family. Um, I've been in some very awkward meetings before, right? You know, that your child has one thought of what they're doing, they're going to California, and you're like, no, you're not, right? <laughs> so it's always fun for Mr. Willett to kind of see how this process works. However, it's good to know because then we kind of all balance that. I've even had parents call me up and say, Mr. Brooke, can you kind of ease this tension that's going on in the, you know, in the house over all this? You know, so I, I try to balance all that. But we will do that, and then once that meeting happens, uh, we're going to talk about you're taking the PSAT, right? I'm going to have all your results back in December. I'm going to be talking to you in that meeting about what's the best test plan for you. Um, I had a family once that, um, they took the SAT. This isn't for every kid, but I said, why don't you just go take the ACT? You know, sometimes just for fun, it's never fun, but just go take it. You know, the kid's looking at me like, Mr. Will, I can't believe you said this to my parent. But I did, and the kid took the ACT, did so much better on the ACT because he was so focused on the SAT that, you know, psychologically, he did better. And so he used those scores. So those are kind of the conversations that are going to come out of that meeting. But what's most important is going to come out of that meeting is we're going to listen to you, we're going to listen to your child, and then we're going to do our own research as a counselor and start adding colleges to this list. So you're going to, oops, let me go back to list. You're going to see on here that uh, the student has put some of these on, and then you're going to see the counselor has added some. And I tell my students, you don't have to like the school I'm putting on there, but I'm trying to line up some colleges that I think you would do really well at. And sometimes it's been surprising because I've had several families come back to me years later and say, Mr. Willett, you would have never gone to this college if you hadn't suggested it. I feel a little pressure for that, you know, right, <laughs> Brett? 
Um, but you know that's what we're doing. And you could literally get rid of all the ones we put on there, or you could say, like, I have a kid out in Purdue who said, never even thought about Purdue. But I went over, we know that's an engineering school. Um, but I also uh, suggested a school out in Terre Haute, Indiana, nobody's ever heard of, Rose Holman. Maybe some of some, I don't know if anybody's heard about it here. But they went and looked at both those schools, and they wanted a little bit more of a watered-down version of engineering. And Rose Holman is literally all engineering. Purdue is engineering, but not so that's what's going to happen with these lists. Um, by, by the end of their junior, junior year, we really want you to be at a point where we understand where your likelies, your uh, uh, targets, and your reaches are. And that's what we do as a big part of our role, is to make sure kids understand where their GPA is and what, where they're going to fall within those three categories. Um, I have kids all the time come in to me and say, here's my list. And I say, okay, this is great, but these are all reaches, right? My role is, as a conservative, you know, with colleges, my role is to make sure that you're getting accepted um, at many of these colleges. So we have to refine some of this, right? Never a problem if a kid wants to put three or four reaches on their, uh, on their list, but we also want to make sure that they have a reasonable list and they know they're going to get accepted. Um, the other thing we do here, I, I guess I'll mention, is we're getting ready to go into blind admissions. Um, anybody know what blind admissions is? So blind admissions is where we sit down with our current seniors, uh, the counselors sit together, and we talk about, not names, but we talk about lists of colleges for each student and whether or not we all feel that they're going to have acceptances, right? And if they don't, then you will get a letter at home letting you know that you're thinking more schools, or that you're perfectly fine. We are comfortable as eight counselors looking at this, that you are perfectly fine and don't need to add it. So those are kind of some of the behind the scenes things that are happening, and you know, and, and we're, we're always happy to do that. Now, when you get into senior year, it's really all about mind. And they will start to refine their list over between junior and senior year, and that is perfectly fine. Um, I have kids that come back all the time and say, I want to add to my uh, list, I want to take away from my list, whatever that may be, that's okay to do. We are so happy, Sarah and I, at this point, to be passing November 1st and November 15th, um, because it is a lot of work. But I have to tell you, the best part of our jobs is when your child comes in, or you come in and you have this biggest smile on your face and your kids jumping up and down going, I got into this school. And yes, there's going to be that type of reaction. There's also going to be the other type of reaction where they're upset. Um, but if we do our role correctly, then you know they will have a mixture of schools that they're going to be happy with. Um, and you know I always say I'm 50 years old, I go back, it was much easier for me to get into college than it is for these poor kids now, right? It's just a really weird scene out there right now with colleges. Um, anyway, I'm just talking away. So, so um, okay, so, so let's take a quick look, look at once they have their list, they're, they're comfortable, then they're, they're going to move everything over to the colleges I'm applying to in an Now, now what, what I always like, like to mention to parents is keep in mind, Naviance is the school's way of communicating to colleges. Common application is the child's way of communicating. They're two separate things, right? So keep that in mind. So once they move these over to colleges and apply to, your counselor's doing all sorts of behind the scenes, behind the scenes things. They're sending school profiles over, they're sending transcripts over, they're doing all this. We only only do this unless until we have approval from the student. Student comes in, does a transcript request form, gives us the approval that we know these are the specific colleges, and then we start sending everything over to colleges that they have. Um, senior year, they're going to ask two teachers for recommendations. I always have this discussion with you as a family, and I have it with my kids. I say to them, who are you most connected to? Who's important to you? Is that's who you want to use. Now, all kids have different ideas of who they think are great and, and who they don't want to ask. Um, always run it by your counselor. Talk it out with your counselor. All teachers write great recommendations, but sometimes you really want to make sure if you have an engineering student, 
that were a science kid. You want science and math though, right? And sometimes the student will say, well, I really want my elective teacher. Well, you're not really picking an elective teacher unless you're planning on going into art, you know, and, and, and giving art classes. So that's really a discussion that we'll have. Now, now they, they won't actually go to their teacher uh, next, next year as a junior and, and ask them uh, verbally. But then when they come back as seniors, they're going to be asking them through Naviance. And I just showed an example up here at request. Um, and you'll see up here where uh, the deadline is October 1st. They've been requested, but the add request button is when you click that, it's going to give you the list of um, teachers that, that they've asked. All of our teachers are on Naviance. But it's also going to tell you what college is required, how many they allow, right? That's always confusing to the kids. Um, counselor recs are always included. They're not included in these numbers. They always expect ours, right? But you'll see, for instance, Trinity College, they require one, two are allowed. So you would want one teacher's fine, right? Um, if they want to send both teachers, perfectly fine, okay? I'm not included in that count. But when you see stuff like seven allowed, 10 allowed, there's no reason to be sending 10 recommendations to a committee, right? So they want to talk that out with us. Um, I don't want them sending 10 recs. I say, then you risk them not picking up my recommendation or an important recommendation that needs to be part of your, um, your file. Um, so that's just discussions that you have in their senior year to kind of help guide them as to what's correct. Now, I should mention that Naviance is only used for teachers, but Common Act, if let's say your kid um, is a dancer or your kid has something outside of school that's extremely important, like synchronized swimming, you know, or uh, whatever that might be, right? Then what they would do is they can ask for recommendations through Common Act. Um, but they want to be careful with that. I had a student uh, uh, a couple years back that did all of them through Common App, and then it won't allow our teachers to send it through Naviance. So there's all sorts of different rules to this, and that's why we want to make sure we're communicating with them. Are most of those teachers from their sophomore year or their junior year? And I, because we only have sophomores or oldest, do they have repeatedly the same teacher sometimes so that they have multiple years? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yes, um, it, generally we want them to pick their junior year teachers. Um, they sometimes will have the same teacher over and over. Uh, you know, one that comes to mind maybe is Latin, because there's not too many Latin teachers. Um, so if that's something that they choose to use, then yes. I've even had kids sometimes that may have not always felt connected to any teacher in their junior year, and they'll say to me, can I wait till my senior year and maybe ask that teacher? And you know, there's always risks a little bit with that. But yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Usually it's always going to be junior year teachers because that's what the college is going to look at on your transcript, is mainly they're going to focus on that year alone and they want to know who's recently known them the best. So great question. Yep. All right. So, so there you go. <laughs> so any other questions? I mean, I know I was, we were all kind of talking. It's a lot of information, but just keep in mind it's early. Uh, so you, some of your questions will be answered as you go along, um, but we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have right now. So yes. Two questions about GPA going back to sure. what you addressed earlier. Um, you said you give colleges the um, weighted GPA, but was it the weighted academic or weighted? A uh, weighted academic. Okay. Yep, that's the one that we send up. Okay, and then the um, academic GPA. If your child, if their electives have to it falls within that core that it would be under, um, under that one. And is the only way to see that is through the transcript or do we start getting that in Power School or Naviance? How do um, we have access the, to the weighted? Yeah, you don't get the weighted through Power School. You yeah. have to call us before or you have to ask for your transcript and then that would be given to you. You're seeing generally like, you know, we're on four quarters, so you're seeing the quarter of the GPA. And that's it. This and that's that, it. Yeah. Okay. And I should mention uh, back here on the transcript that 
just know that quarterly um, grades are those are not given to colleges. We're a semester school, so it's only semester um, grades that are uh, sent over as you can see those transcripts. Semester one, semester two, that's what semester two. Follow up to that, is that a weighted GPA that we're seeing? No, so you're not seeing any weighted GPA. You will only always see weighted GPAs only on those four lines. So great question. Um, these will be mailed to you at the end of this year uh, and going into your junior year. So in the summertime, you will get a uh, junior letter and these will be attached. Do you have another question? Yes. Class rank. So um, we do not rank. So our school does not class rank. We do not provide that to colleges. However, if you ever want to know your ranking, you can always reach out to your counselor and they can give you the ranking of your child. Yeah, and part of that is um, in an effort to, it really does benefit the students, um, the class rank piece. And also what colleges do receive is they receive a school profile where we show the grade distribution of the class. So they get a sense percentile wise where the student falls. It's not an exact rank though. I have seen students who, you know, took that leap, they jumped to the honors class, maybe they had a 72 semester one, worked with the teacher moving forward, and then maybe it didn't go to the, you know, an 81 range, but they got it up to a 78 range, and I, I think that that does show some demonstrated growth within a difficult subject. So that's also what's nice about the breakdown on the transcript at New Canaan is the semester grades. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Know that they took that. It was scary, enough, right? Maybe it was scary, but they took it, and they might not have done as well as they thought they were going to do, but they still took that. So, uh, so we'll go back here. Look back.
Um, you mentioned the, the school profile that you sent, and the colleges have also mentioned that they look at the school profile in the context of the student's application. And a school like New Canaan that has such a robust AP and honors curriculum, um, I almost feel like I was getting the message that it hurts kids who don't take the four or five AP classes because they see that all these classes are offered. Is that my no, imagination? No, it's not. And I, I think that that's the big question for all of us, right? I think sometimes universities say this, and they don't always follow what they're saying. So, um, you know, so, but I also go back to, you know, to say we have to meet the student where they're at. And if we know that they're not going to do well in four APs, I'm always saying to my students, no, this is not appropriate. Now, they can make whatever decision they want to make. I just want to make clear that it's not, but I think you're right. You know, um, I, I would say colleges, you know, say a lot that they look at things holistically, and they do. But you're always going to have scenarios like that where if you're dealing with Harvard or you're dealing with Yale, then they are going to want to see those types of things. So I think it depends on what school and where you're going to So, But I think, I think you should, yes, I agree. So piggybacking on that one, does it matter how many AP courses they take. I know you talk about rigor and balance, and you can counsel on don't go for six APs, maybe right. cut it down. But you mentioned that the factor that is applied for the GPA is kind of the same for AP or honors. It's 1.07. So do the colleges kind of look at that, or are they really checking to see, oh, you took six APs, so I'm going to apply in whatever GPA calculation the college is doing, that you're going to give this a high rating because this child did six AP courses. Right, so so some of these questions are hard to answer, you know, right? Because I'm not sitting in the committee themselves, but what I would say is that they are looking at AP classes. They are looking at all of that. So if they have a kid who's doing very, very well, and they have six or seven APs, that's going to vote well for them through the application stage. If they see a kid with six or seven APs and the GPA is tanked, that's not good. So I do agree that if you're capable, you should be leaning towards taking, I don't want to say as many APs, but you definitely should be looking at those AP level courses. So, so I don't know fully how to, to answer that question, but you know, I probably went around that question. But, but do the kids know? The kids know that the factor work is the same for AP and honors. Do the students know that themselves? I'm sorry, say that again? Do the students also know that the factor is the same whether it's Yes, they should. You know, they should know that. Because so. I always hear, oh no, I have to take an AP class. It yeah. shows I'm committed. It shows I can do more. But we try to balance. share that information in you know some of my talks with my students. I also, just so you know, I also tell my freshmen to always go to the program of studies because they always have questions over and over about attendance, sometimes about the honors and AP. So I know it's a lot of information, but I always think the program of studies is definitely uh, good because that also gives them a sequence of how they get to an AP multivariable math, um, and they don't always know that. So I typically go over that my freshman meeting so they can, you know, they don't all do it, but at least they know that that's there. And for you as parents, you know, if you just Google 20, you know, 2022 program of studies between high school, you will see all that information that talks about everything we talked about with GPAs and your attendance and all that. Uh, yeah, I just want to, and having gone through this even with my two boys in a comparable school, this whole discussion is absolutely 100% individual to each student. I have to give the example, I taught history at the college level. You put me in an M2 level algebra one, and I'm going to cry, I'm going to spend a disproportionate amount of time on that, because that's who I was, and that's where my talents, my interests, and my abilities at that time were. The how many APs, I go back to earlier in the discussion, the teachers make recommendations. There will be a set of recommendations from the school counselor in the whole planning process. They're going to be geared on your child at that point in his or her development, if you will. 
So it's more important to understand that all of these decisions really should be reflective, not where success is defined down the line, but where they are at this time. We offer an advanced placement uh, social studies class in the sophomore year. Some kids are not development, it's not a knock, it's not a deficit model, are not ready at that point for that. It doesn't preclude them from junior year taking something, but all of these discussions really have to be driven by an honest, collaborative discussion of anybody who can contribute to this discussion as to where your kid will be set up for the best success in the next year or where they are now, even semester to semester. So, so there is no one answer. And that's compounded by the fact that having watched not just my own sons, but even here for the last 19 years, the college application and admission process, there is no sense to it at all. No, seriously. And, I, and it kills me because there are so many factors that play into it. And what our counselors do very, very well, even Willie, is that, <laughs> thank you. I gotta blindly support you. Um, is, is, that, is that you're looking in this process, which begins in earnest a year from now, if you will, to really look for genuine, valid opportunities. And, and so this definition of success and what's the proper path is completely individualized. And, and so keep these things in mind, but understand that everybody's committed to setting your kid up to do the best they can at that point. So again, even the numbers of APs, who takes this, the counseling that goes on in the course selection process is beyond value. Because it really is taking into account all the things that have been talked about. And I, I say this quite honestly. Um, all our counselors do that very seriously and from a very informed standpoint. And just keep that in mind in working with that. And Mr. Rothman is our ninth, ninth counselor. So thank you, Mr. Rothman. <laughs> kind of related to this, but let's say a child is capable of doing whatever six ages, right? And have the right grades. But maybe there's a question about the balance where you could be doing five APs and an extracurricular activity or six APs. Is there one that's better than the other? So, I mean, I guess I would answer that to say, you know, your kid is great. It depends on where they're at. But let's not be superhuman, right? And let's let them have a good junior and senior year. So I would answer that and say, if there's an extracurricular activity that's important to them and they enjoy it, that's going to help balance when they go and take those five days, right? And the college is going to see that, right? So I agree with you. I think you have to take each individual and look at it of what's the right thing. But as Mr. Rothman said, we should always be, you should always be talking to me or your counselor about those questions. And what we do is we may not have the exact right answer for you, but at least we can all talk it out and say we're comfortable with this, right? The hardest part for us or the hardest part for my job is if I sat on those committees, I'd accept every kid that I counsel because I've got to know them. They're awesome. They're great kids. And that's the hardest part about the committees, right? All they're seeing is your essay, your application. It puts no human, like anything, into it. And that's the hardest part about this process. So, and that's why our counselor recs are so important because I tell my kids, when I say hello to a kid out there and they're like, did that man just speak to me? I'm like, yes, I'm your school counselor, right? <laughs> I tell them, come, come in and talk to me as much as they can because I just finished 48 recommendations. I write them on the weekends. And my seniors this year did an excellent job getting to know me. So when I sat down to write, man, it was flowing really nicely. 
versus a kid who doesn't. So encourage your kids as sophomores to get in and see their counselors. And back, back to, to your original question, question it's, it's great, great to be able to say they're a great student and, and, and then have that and after to speak, speak to that because there's, there's so, so many life, life skills they get from the extracurriculars. So just to finish up, because we now will have a line of students waiting, oh. we'll do one more question. And then I just have two quick questions. So there was that UConn free application process two days ago. Was, um, can the other schools you apply early decision and early action to see that you would apply to UConn? No. No, no colleges, will not, or colleges will never know what other schools you're That's um, good to know. And the other thing is, Navion, when does it update the SAT score? Because we find it's way, how long do you wait? Is it three weeks? Is it so um, how it gets updated is through downtown or the, they, the administration will update that. Typically, it's updated you know, within, I think, five, maybe five to six weeks. But if you have your numbers back, and you yeah. know them, know. and I don't necessarily know them, call your counselor because that happens to me all the time. Knows. What is it? Counselor knows, but well, we I can, don't know why they went. I mean, well, I says it doesn't really matter if you can see the data. Well, it does matter, and I can update. Uh, like, I go into the audience, and I put it as the update, and then those numbers show up. No. So. It's a super cool. Yeah. Any other questions, uh, both Sarah and I will stand right here. If you don't feel comfortable asking out here, come up and ask us. So thank you so much, everyone.